and we are back. Another Saturday door knocking session with your boy Brandon. So yes, I'm out here finally banging the doors again uh, after getting my flip fully finished. Uh, so I'm gonna see if I can, uh, God, I was even there today, you guys. I was there today watering the plants at the front. Um, I should have just done a video for you guys, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll make sure to do that before it sells. Um, but yeah, we went live on my flip, uh, so it is fully finished. We went live yesterday, uh, which is Friday, today's Saturday. So, uh, just wanted to make another video for you guys. Uh, this one's gonna be about a specific topic. Um, it's called Subject 2. And I think I may have made like, just kind of a brief overarching, you know, um, video about the different types of seller financing. Um, and the reason why I want to talk about subject two today, one, because, you know, Pace Morby is huge, right? So I'm going to, uh, you know, try to try to piggyback off of some of his success. Um, but um, I'm actually probably like 90% going to buy a property for myself, subject two. I signed the purchase and sell agreement uh, yesterday. So we have a signed contract. So I am under contract with a wholesaler to buy a uh, property subject to. So let me tell you guys a little bit about it. Um, so the property itself is a three bed, two bath, split level house, about 1,700-ish square feet, 1,723. Um, I have already walked it twice. Um, apparently the situation with this and why this seller wants to do subject two is because they are a investor. They are a landlord and they fixed up the property really nice and in a very, and this is very unfortunate, in a very unfortunate situation, uh, the tenants uh, that he had picked apparently stopped paying rent, kind of destroyed the place, like not too bad, right? Like I walked it, they kind of destroyed the place a little bit and um, he had to evict them. So, instead of going through this again where he has to do new floors, where he has to in, you know, paint the entire place, clean it, get rid of all the junk that these people left, I'm willing to do that stuff. So I'm willing to give him and the wholesaler I'm buying this property from a check for $55,000. So this is money that's gonna come out of my home equity line of credit. Anytime you can keep cash, physical cash, hold on to that, right? Having the access to cash is important. So I'm using my home equity line of credit for the 55K. And I think I might move into this property. Um, it doesn't really make sense as a flip. So I'm just gonna be honest with you guys, I ran all the numbers. This is why they're not just selling it as a flip because the guy owes $350,000 on his mortgage. The, the interest rate is 3.75%. So the interest rate is attractive, but the amount he owes on the property doesn't allow him to sell it for enough or to, at a low enough price where it would make sense for an investor to buy it and flip it. Uh, basically, he needs a check for 350 just to just to get out of the deal, right? He wouldn't even make any money. A check for 350. The property probably like to to get it into pristine listing condition probably needs like 50k worth of work, right? So 50K worth of like labor and materials, you know, that's flooring, paint, new appliances, right? Because they took all the appliances. Uh, it probably should have like new siding done. Uh, the roof is fine. Uh, has a radon mitigation system already in it. So that's fine. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of work. And, you know, it's a decent sized, you know, square foot. It's, it's got a pretty big backyard. So you got to do a lot of landscaping. So it's definitely, you know, and you're paying people. If I was to do it all myself, right? Definitely less than 50K. But if you were to pay somebody to do all this work for you, like most flippers do, probably looking, I would say, conservatively at 50K. You could, you could easily spend more than that. So now this guy sold it for basically nothing, right? He, he got no money. And then a flipper buys it, puts 50K into it, 
you know, conservatively. Now he's all into the deal. He or she is all into the deal for um, 400. The property might sell for 450. 450 is probably like what it could sell for on the open market. Um, so you know, it 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 may or may not you know sell for that. And then you have a bunch of costs associated, right? You have selling costs, you have uh, realtors closing fees and, and costs. You have hold you have holding costs from your hard money loan that you use to pay this guy three hundred fifty thousand. Because how many people have three hundred fifty thousand dollars to just give somebody, right? So used a hard money loan. Whoops, sorry. Um, so you know, it, it just doesn't pencil. It, there is a you know, it, it, you would be very lucky as an investor to flip that property and break even. So then you ask Brandon, well, why the heck are you buying it? Well, let me tell you why. Because two years ago, I purchased a four unit building and this is and this is what I believe to be the best strategy. I purchased a four unit building, um, so a fourplex. Uh, I purchased that building and I owner occupied it with an FHA loan. So I used an FHA loan when that was still the best deal. Now they've come out with better financing options, such as a conventional mortgage. You can put 5% down and you don't, is it 5%? I believe it's 5%. Check with your lender. If you need a good lender, I know somebody who works in a bunch of different states. But it's 5% down to get into a four unit building with no sustainability uh, rule to follow, like what I had to do. If you use an FHA loan to buy a four unit building, at least in Oregon, not familiar with every other state and, and, and lending products, but FHA is a federally backed loan and they're one of their requirements for a, four, I think it's a three and a four unit building, not a duplex, but three and four units is you have a sustainability clause that you have to be able to cover. Anyways, I don't wanna go into that. This is a different video. But anyways, I've been living in an apartment for about two years and I'm ready to move. I'm ready to move on with my life. Um, so I want to buy a house and move into it. So I'm doing that and I'm buying it subject to because the interest rate provides a lower monthly payment than what I could get today. So subject to is not an assumption of the current loan. That is the quote unquote right way to do it is to go get a loan and get and assume that other per, or get approved by that person's company and assume that guy's loan. That is quote unquote the right way to do it. Subject two is I'm just buying this property from this guy and I'm taking over his payments on his behalf. So this is looking good for his credit because the loan is still in his name. So every on-time payment I make is good for him and that's good for his credit. My credit's fine already, but I'm making the payments on his behalf. I have control of the asset. I have the front door key. I have the right to sell it. Um, I am control. I am the owner of the property. I'm just not the owner of the debt, right? but I'm making those payments on his behalf. So that's kind of what subject to is, right? So I'm making the payments to his loan. I'm living there. I can sell it if I want to, right? Cause I'm the one on the deed. Um, I, I have control of the physical location, right? The actual property. I, and then of course, when I, if I was to go to sell, right? The, the mortgage company would see that there is a first position loan or lien from the, the bank and that would have to be paid first. So I'm not, you know, the bank will always get paid. Most important, make those payments on time, be properly insured, you know, and, and every, the bank, everything stays the same for the bank. They're still getting their payments. They're still getting their interest. Everything stays the same, except I'm just making the payments on this guy's behalf. Um, and you know what? I might be more qualified than the, than the person that they, um, that they were lending to. So, I mean, I don't know that, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that I am. I'm just, you know, maybe his, maybe his credit score is a little bit lower than mine. Maybe he makes a little bit less than I do. I don't know, right? But I'm just saying, I could be more qualified than that guy. Um, 
Well, I mean, I guess if he is a doctor and has an 800 credit score, he'd be more qualified than me. But I have assets and stuff, right? Like, you know, I, I'll, I'll be all right. So anyway, so I'm taking this over subject two, and the reason why I'm not buying just a regular conventional mortgage is because my debt to income, when a bank looks at me, my debt to income is a little too high. It makes them feel a little uncomfortable that I would not be able to make the payments for all of these properties. And here's where I disagree. When a bank looks at my rentals, right, they look at my rent agreements, my lease agreements that I have with, with tenants, they only take 75% of my lease agreement and apply it towards my income. And obviously that's not true, right? Because I am getting the full lease payment, not just 75%, I'm getting the full lease payment. Let me roll up my window here. I was just getting some fresh air. But so I'm getting the full lease payment. But anyways, that's what makes my debt to income ratio look not as good because they um, because they they don't believe that I am, you know, and, and I get it, right? It's Ritz, and, and sorry for a long video, you guys, but this is important. You know, you gotta understand the bank, you gotta understand these things, right? Um, for a bank, they're looking at risk mitigation. And they understand, as I do, that sometimes renters will leave and I will have vacancy. I will have expenses associated with the property. And I get it. And I've planned for that, right? Like, I, I understand. Um, but they, on top of that, on top of my reserves that I have, cash, they also want to put in extra reserves, right? So that's why they, they don't give me the full 100% of my lease agreements when I go to buy properties. So anyways, so my DTI is a little high, and even if I was, let's say I was the perfect borrower right now, I would not buy a house in today's current interest rates. And yes, they've gone down, and thank goodness they have. But we are still at higher than, you know, higher interest rates than, than it, than, then we sh I don't want to say then we should or any of that stuff. The economy itself is a really big topic I'm not going to get into. But regardless, I just I don't think interest rates really make sense right now as they currently are to buy houses because your payment is more than what you can get for rent in Oregon where I'm investing. So right now it doesn't make sense in Oregon where I'm investing because you will not be able to get uh, your payments covered by a renter and that's important to me because I want cash flow so I am buying a property where the payment is 2350 if I was to clean this place up do new floors do new paint appliances I could put a renter in there for 26 2700 is that a great deal uh, is that a great deal for me not really right because I know that I'd be making three or four hundred dollars a month I want to make more than that. And single family properties don't really do that. And that three or four hundred, I'm gonna tell you guys that three or four hundred, and anybody on bigger pockets and all this other stuff, all these people, the three or four hundred dollars I make in cash flow, you have to set a hundred percent of that aside for vacancy repair, capex expenses, uh, uh, lawyer fees, uh, evictions, right? So you can't really live off of that, right? There, that that's not enough money for you to go and live off of. You need to set all that aside for uh, uh, unforeseen expenses, whether it be home related or tenant related. But I could do that, right? So I basically own an asset with a reasonable payment and renters paying it for me to pay the other guy's mortgage, right? So it's not a terrible deal. So that's why I'm willing to do it, is at the very least it'll break even in my sense, right? It will cash flow, but in my sense, it'll break even um, with repairs, capex, vacancy, all that stuff. It'll break even. I'll own an asset. Somebody else will be paying for it, and um, and I and I want to move into it. So, is it the best house in the neighborhood? Far from it. In fact, it's probably the worst neighbor. It's the worst house in that neighborhood. But those are the things that we buy. And I'm, I'm inflating my lifestyle, and I'm just gonna admit it right here. 
it's costing me more to move into and renovate this house and live in it than it would if I just stayed in the apartment that I was at. But at some point, you guys, you need to get a little bit more comfortable, right? So I'm not buying a mansion, right? This is 1,700 square feet, not a mansion. The payment is 2350 not unreasonable, especially right now, right, with the current interest rates. So I am still making smart moves, but I am upgrading my lifestyle. It is going to cost me more to, to make this move than if I just stayed where I was at plus 55k out of my HELOC that I'm going to have to pay back. But my plan with my my home uh, my flip and this could not work. So right, I'm just hoping and hope is a terrible strategy. I'm hoping that with my flip I get all of my money back, the 40,000 that I put into it, so I get all that money back to pay back my HELOC. So my HELOC will go down 40,000 and some credit cards. And whatever profit I get from this flip Hopefully it's some, could be none, I could lose money. But if it sells for anything above 375, I will make some money, me and my partner will make some money, and I will take that money and I will use that to pay down my home equity line of credit even more. Um, so that's the strategy. And you know, I'm always actively looking to get more income, right? I'm meeting with other investors, I'm talking and saying, hey, how can I help you? How can, how can we make money? I see people that have deals, I'll JV with them and say, hey, I'm going to try to find you a buyer, and if I can, can you kick me a little bit back? Of course, people, no one's opposed to that. Hey, um, I see that you need a loan on a property. If I can find someone who's willing to give you a loan, will you give me a finder's fee? Sure, I'll give you a little bit, right? So I have my own sources of income, I'm working with other investors, I'm helping people find flips, buy flips, fund flips, right? just connecting people there's definitely money in connecting people so just you know realize that be a value uh, to people be a resource um, and you you know you'll be fine but I uh, just wanted to make this video talking more about subject to you know and kind of some updates with the things that are going on if you guys have any questions drop them down below peace